Hello, I'm Janet Marana, the Executive Director of Priests for Life. I'm also the Executive Director of Gospel of Life Ministries and Ending Abortion U.S. And of course, I co-founded the Silent No More Awareness Campaign, and I'm seen on EWTN on the Catholic View for Women. Well, we have exciting news here now, a weekly pro-life show on our channel, and I hope you're going to join us each and every week. Joining me right now is my co-host of this exciting program, pro-life leader, Frank Pavone. Welcome to the program. Well, it's good to be together again here in our uh, Priest for Life headquarters. We have this great studio and uh, wonderful to be uh, doing yet another program. We have a whole lineup of different programs exactly. that we've been doing for years. And uh, this is another, this will be another nice addition to the lineup. It really will be. And of course, you know, there's so much that develops each week in the pro-life movement. So I want our viewers to understand, tune in every week, and we will give you the latest, what you can do. Because I think, wouldn't you say, with the overruling of Roe, people are kind of wondering, like, what's the next step? They're waiting yes. for marching orders. These are going to be their marching orders. <laughs> These right? programs and, and, and will be. As well as an understanding of what the difference is now that Roe v. Wade is reversed, the movement still hasn't fully grasped what this means and what the new opportunities are right. that it brings about. But and we'll I, help them. And I want to remind our, our viewers that at the end of every program, you got to stay with us for the whole program, because at the end of every program, we're going to offer a free gift for you just for being part of our supporters and our pro-life team. So as always, we always like to start with a prayer, but I invoke the Lord, mm -hmm. blessing on our work. And we have this beautiful devotional called Pro-Life Reflections for Every Day. I think you wrote it, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> okay, so what's our uh, scripture quote and our reflection and prayer for today? Well, today we look at Romans 8, 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then the one who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. Reflection. The Holy Spirit gives life. Bringing forth creation at the beginning of time, descending upon Mary to bring about the Incarnation, bringing forth the Eucharist from mere bread and wine, and descending upon the graves of God's people to raise them from the dead. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, come and work through your people to build the culture of life. Keep us close to you. Fill us with yourself. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and of course, this beautiful devotional, Pro-Life Reflections for Every Day, available at our online store at prolifeproducts.org. And you so. know, Janet, the devotions <laughs> in this book are part of pro-life spirituality. One of the right. things, as we'll discuss here, is that we, and this is one of the things that distinguishes us from other pro-life organizations, we teach the arguments, we teach the strategy, we teach the politics, but we are uniquely positioned to present pro-life as a spirituality. Not only the teaching, but the activity. What virtues drawn from our relationship with God shape how we do pro-life work? So we've developed this pro-life spirituality over the decades. It was strongly influenced by our relationship with John Paul II right. and his encyclical, The Gospel of Life, as well as our relationship with Mother Teresa, St. Teresa of Calcutta, as well as our relationship with Cardinal John O'Connor. They all taught pro-life spirituality. They might not have called it by those words, but that's what it is. And so we teach people, believers, Christians, how to live out their discipleship of Christ in their service to the unborn. That's right. Uh, and these prayers, this is part of it too. I mean, each of these prayers in this devotional show how that works. Well, and of course, uh, 2023 is an exciting year for us here at Priest for Life because it marks the 30th anniversary of your leadership yes. of this organization. I'd like to reflect back though, because <laughs> I remember, of course, I've known you for oh, 34 years. And I remember when you discerned with Cardinal O'Connor to go off and, and do that Priest for Life work. Right. Uh, and of course, he gave you full permission. Right. But Priest for Life back 30 years ago, it, it started very small, three priests out in San Francisco. They had a couple of thousand people on their mailing list. And I remember th that you told me about them officially voting for you to lead the organization and giving you a check for what, a couple thousand dollars and saying, yeah. Well, here, go for it and, and, and get this work going. Right. And when you, when you think how blessed we have been because of our donors, right, 
of how did we grow all this? Your leadership, tireless work, is where I think we got to this point today. Well, it started off that, yeah, literally with a $3,000 check. Now we're, we have one of the biggest uh, pro-life organizations in the, in the world. But uh, the vote of confidence of those priests who elected me to that position and of Cardinal O'Connor and the blessing that he gave to this work and the thirst that people have for their clergy to be more vocal on the matter of abortion. Right. That's what <laughs> rallied them around us. Right. Yes, we want something <laughs> for the priests to, 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 to awaken them. And people always ask us when they hear priests for life, oh, isn't every priest for life? Well, we just helped them to say so. That's right. And you know, when you think back, uh, Dr. Bernard Nathanson, as we both knew, was the uh, founder of the abortion industry here in America. And remember what he told you? Yes. He, he, he said, we would never have gotten away with what we did if you, the church, mm -hmm. had been united, purposeful, and strong. And particularly the clergy. Especially the clergy. Yeah. And <clears throat> they counted on the silence of the church. They did. That was their strategy. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're still pushing <laughs> the priest <laughs> and the clergy, and I mean priests, deacons, and even all denominations, to come on, get on board. Well, that's why Nathanson was something. so excited about this, this war. He, he yes. strongly endorsed Priests for Life. In fact, he, he said we us, should be 10 times bigger than we are. <laughs> and he called us the Paul Reveres, of remember? The pro -life movement, of the pro-life yeah. movement. Yeah. And so, that, you know, with this 30th anniversary and how much we've grown, I want people to understand that, you know, when they donate to our organization, because people say, oh, look at all the money uh, Priests priest for Life might have. Well, you know what? It comes in, it goes out the door because of all the different branches of our ministry that right. we support. Right. You know? right. We're doing the work. We're yeah. doing the work. And uh, I remember one of the earliest um, branches, so to speak, was Deacons for Life and Seminarians for Life. Yes. We brought those on board initially. Well, it makes sense because if you're going to train priests to be active in pro-life, when does the training of priests start? Seminary. Well, when you're in the, in the seminary, of course, right. it starts just from your growth as a human being, but your seminary training has to include strong pro-life basis and, and right. not, just a, not just a training in the teaching, a training in how to conduct the battle. That's Those right. Those are two different things. Yeah. So, I, you know, I want people to uh, be encouraged right now. Um, if you have a priest who's active, active, and you don't feel like he's plugged into us, I want them to be in touch with us. Isn't there a special place that they can sign up the clergy? Yes, that's right. Well, you know, we have a special website, prolife.church. Ah. So church is the actual extension of the web address, prolife.church. And that has all the, uh, in one place, all the different resources. We've developed resources for preaching. As you know, I have a whole book on uh, it takes all of the Sunday readings each, right. each week mm -hmm. by week and shows the priest or the or the or the pastor of other denominations if they want to use those readings how to bring up the abortion and issue. And that book is called Proclaiming the Message of Life. Right. Available at our online store at right. org. We have prayer resources like we were just discussing here and many other prayer books besides this. Again, right. all focused in on how our relationship with Christ impels us to defend the unborn. That's the idea. Right. And and all these prayer resources are, are based on that. Then you have the preach okay, the preaching resources, the prayer resource, and then the mobilization. So priests need to be leading their people in prayer, teaching them the, the truth, and then mobilizing them for action. So what kind of pro-life projects should a parish be doing? Right. Well it's not just the diocese that tells them ideas about that. The diocese is, is not necessarily going to have, I mean, none of them have like all the different pro-life activities that are going on. The movement is very big and we're right at the center of that movement. In fact, another thing we can talk about here is how not only we, we, we network the clergy, we network the pro-life leaders themselves. Exactly. They'll be coming here in a few weeks um, for a meeting. But, but, but that's the idea that we help the priests know the kinds of projects, the kinds of activities. Like for example, right now during these days, there's um, going to be a vote in Congress about pro-life measures, of right. extending the protections of the unborn, protecting our taxpayer money from, uh, from going for abortion and, and, and protecting the pregnancy centers. Uh, we, 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 we tell the pastors, tell your people, and we give them just properly timed notifications, tell your people to call their member of Congress to vote. and vote for this, <clears throat> right? right? Well then, okay, so we had the priests for life, deacons for life, seminarians for life. Then the next branch that came to us 
was Dr. Teresa Burke and her husband, Kevin, from Rachel's Vineyard. And people may not realize, but first of all, that is the largest uh, healing after abortion retreat program, not just in the United States, but in the entire world. Well, and we serve, what, s over 70 countries, right? 70 countries. Uh, the retreat manual has been translated now into about 27 different languages. It's worldwide. Worldwide. Yeah. Hundreds of retreats happen every month. And people will say, oh, so when I donate to Priest for Life, that helps fund that too? Absolutely, because they have an office up in Philadelphia with yeah. uh, six employees, and uh, they constantly training new retreat sites. So if anyone's watching, and maybe you're thinking, oh, let me go to that site, rachelsvineyard.org. Oh, is there a retreat program in my diocese or in my area or in my county? And if the answer is no, and you have people who want to do it, you contact us, and they will start the training. They'll mm -hmm. tell you what's necessary. And it's not just Catholic retreats. They also have an interdenominational program, too. So people of all faiths uh, can get Rachel's Vineyard in their community for real healing. Isn't it, it? It's healing based on the Word of God, for those that are Catholic, based also on the power of the sacraments, and based on the solid psychological research that Teresa Burke and others have done. Right. And this is a, um, you know, this, this is, I'm, I'm privileged to serve as the pastoral director of this worldwide, and also as the chairman of the board. <laughs> so it's integrated with all that we do. Um, I got to know Teresa Burke back in those early years of Priests for Life when I first got permission 30 years ago to do this. And uh, I always saw, both of us always saw, the natural connection between this retreat process and the role of the, of the, of the priest, right? right? Because you're, you're, you're talking about a spiritual as well as a psychological healing. Right. And, you know, very often, as we know, uh, we hear uh, women will say, especially women who've had an abortion, well, you know, they go to confession and the clergy will say, but they keep coming back and keep you know, confessing the same the same sin. Well, it's because they haven't done the whole grief process, mm -hmm. and that's the extra piece that the retreat does for them. And when uh, when Kevin and Teresa came to us, this was 2003, and we began the actual integration of Rachel's Vineyard as a priest for life ministry. It, this, it, the, the the growth skyrocketed at that point. Yes, it you did. know, because we gave them all the administrative and financial support that they needed. That they needed, right? and um, likewise were able to be a bridge for so many of the clergy. And, right. uh, you know, Pope Francis has um, indicated both to me, face and to, to face, me, and face to you, face. You, you, you talked with him, <laughs> he told and me, to Teresa Burke. He said it's a good work to go forward with it. That's what he let said. Let it grow yeah. more. And, yeah. and, you know, Pope Benedict did the same. We remember when Pope Benedict, who, who recently, of course, passed away and uh, was buried there in St. Peter's, the um, Pontifical Academy for Life, I served on that academy for several years, and, 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 and most of it was under his pontificate. He invited, um, the academy invited Teresa to give a presentation. I was, you and I were both at the meeting as right. well. And then the Pope Benedict received all of us, and, and he expressed in his words that day how the uh, work of the church in healing people from the wounds of abortion has to collaborate. He said it's not an option, it's necessary to collaborate with all the different ministries that God raises up in the church. And as you already said, right. we're the largest. And then, of course, an outgrowth, outgrowth of Rachel's Vineyard and all the other healing programs was when I co-founded with George at Forney of Anglicans for Life, the Silent No More Awareness campaign. And we're celebrating this year our 20th year That's of right. the campaign. Because, because this is the 50th uh, uh, year since Roe v. Wade, now defunct right. uh, decision of the court. And the Silent No More campaign came about because we were strategizing, we've got to do something special for the 30th anniversary of right. Roe. We said, there's got to be, what, what's a new angle or what, what's... What and it was we, the voices of the women. The voices of the women. Which right. had, it, it's not that those voices hadn't been uh, out there before. I mean, right from the very beginning... Oh, this goes of all the way back abortion. to the 80s, yeah, even. Weba, Weba, women exploited by abortion. American victims of, of abortion, abortion with right. uh, Olivia. But now it had to take a more center stage. Well, because there were more people, first of all. And at the all. time, Nellie Gray embraced the idea. 
Uh, and she, of course, was the founder of March for Life. And so we began the very first events uh, after the March for Life in front of the Supreme Court, women giving testimonies. By the following year, and so the women hold the signs, I regret my abortion. By I the remember, following I remember year, sitting in the hotel room coming up with that phrase. That's what, right. What can be on the side? It's got to be short. It's got to get right to the heart of it. And we came up with, right. I regret my abortion. I regret my abortion. Uh, then the following year, we had our first man come and we came, we, of course, we asked the men how they felt. And we mm -hmm. came with, I regret lost fatherhood. Because mm -hmm. that's what it is, that they've lost their fatherhood. Yeah. That baby being yeah. killed. And then uh, in 2015, expanded even further to grandparents who mourn their aborted grandchild, siblings who mourn their, their brother or sister. And that's very unique because they have a real sense of someone's missing from the family tree, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and now we had uh, abortion providers, abortion doctors like Dr. Libertino holding signs with us and marching saying, I regret uh, performing abortions. Uh, then we had clinic workers, I regret uh providing abortion. And so the campaign has just been blossoming. And I just want to remind people, if you uh, want to see these testimonies, just go to abortiontestimony.com. We've got the great search engine. You want to read ones that are about the chemical abortion, or you want to read rape and incest, whatever the circumstances are, we have the testimonies there. So uh, abortiontestimony.com is the place to go. Well, you know, I think we're going to take a break right now. And when we come back, we are going to be discussing the other branches of our ministry. And we're going to give you some more important tools, the things you could be doing. And of course, don't forget at the end, a free gift is coming to you. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Each time a child is killed, many other people are wounded and they may not even realize it. Mom and dad, grandparents, siblings, and friends all get hurt. Some of them grieve a life they helped to kill. Others grieve a life they tried to save but could not. Every abortion also hurts the abortionists themselves who are dehumanized in the process. And abortion hurts the pro-life advocates who tried to stop it. They too must grieve the child who was killed. The wound of abortion is multifaceted and therefore so is the healing. The Silent No More Awareness Campaign has launched a new project to raise awareness about the many dimensions of the damage abortion does. Called Healing the Shockwaves of Abortion, this effort focuses each month on a different group of people who are wounded and need healing. Let's all promote this great symphony of healing. Visit AbortionShockwaves.com for more information. Well, hello, Janet Miranda here. Welcome back to our program. Well, of course, we're discussing about Priest for Life, our 30th anniversary. And one of the things we do is as a clergy will minister to their people, we minister to the pro-life movement. That's and right. Pro-life leaders. Tell us a little bit about that. We're a center of unity, a networking force. We have been from day one. You know, the first thing I did once I uh, got the permission to do this work, besides learning how to, you know, use a computer more, learning about email, and I didn't know anything when we first started, I uh, started uh, going around and visiting with all the national pro-life leaders one right. by one. Right. I remember visiting the offices of Judy Brown, of Human Life International, of Operation Rescue. Joe Scheidler. Like, uh, and Pro-Life Action League, that's right. In fact, he invited other leaders to come from the, In from Chicago. the Chicagoland right. area. Uh, uh, this is part of what we do. We right. want to encourage these leaders. In fact, we didn't have anything. You know, we talked before about how they, they handed me an initial $3,000 budget, you know. <laughs> and, um, and yet, we went around to these leaders and we said, how can we help you? Right. How yeah. can we help you? And they were so excited that there was something like this. So now, we have for many years now, for decades, we've been coordinating the quarterly meetings of national pro-life leaders. A lot of the people don't know that this happens, but we get together. Mm -hmm. um, for a full day of updating. And then once a year, we extend that to three days. And that's coming up, isn't it? In February here at our headquarters. And after the, the initial meeting, then we have what's called a pro-life strategy meeting. Uh, and the really good thing about even all these meetings throughout the year is we give each other updates of what each group is doing for several reasons. Number one, so we collaborate. And number two, so we don't like work at cross purposes. We're working together. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's so so uh, it's, it's, and the leaders really appreciate that and yeah. they trust our leadership on that. And then of course you 
personally have helped so many of these leaders come into the movement when they were yes. younger. They wanted to get involved. And some of them you've even brought yeah, into Chris, the Catholic Church. Kristen right? Hawkins tells me, oh, my first protest was with you in a National Right to Life convention. You invited me to come outside and take part in a protest. Yeah, I mean, that's right. Like and that's that. Kristen Hawkins yeah, Kristen from Hawkins Students, for, Students life. for Life. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Well, you know, I have a couple quotes here. The first one comes from Abby Johnson. Oh, yes. Founder of And Then There Were None, which helps abortion providers and staff leave the business. And she said, that you are the reason that she is here today, emotionally and spiritually, uh, that you have given her guidance and direction and that she could not have found uh, that from anyone else, she said. And she also said, I am particularly emotion an emotional person. I am not particularly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's not a particularly emotional person, right? And she said the first time she heard you speak at an event about clinic workers, she cried, she wept. And she said, he could see inside my heart how he knew my thoughts, because this is his life. He isn't just in this for the children. He's in it for the people like me too, the wounded, the broken, the angry, the scared. And so Abby is just one of countless leaders that I know you have helped. Like Lila Rose is another one uh, with live action. You've helped her. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and of course, let's not forget Norma McCorvey, the Jane Rowe. Well, the Roe Jane Roe, Roe, we both uh, were very close friends with her. And right. uh, uh, you sat right next to her as she was in that ceremony, received into the Catholic Church, and right. I gave her the Sacrament of Confirmation. And um, yeah, I mean, these are the people, Sandra Kano, the Doe of Dovey Bolton. I mean, people know the cases if they're but involved in the, the movement. We know the people, too. <laughs> And of closely, you know, yes. and, and that's why, you know, it, it's not a lot of people know them just from when they're in front of the cameras or they're they're in front of the crowds. Uh, we knew them when the cameras were turned off and the crowds went away. Right. What did they suffer? What did they experience? What did they do? I remember going to Norma's house. You and I would both stop in there when we would visit Dallas. And there she was uh, uh, after supper sitting in her living room making rosaries right. by hand mm -hmm. to send off to the, you know, to the to the mission lands, right? I, I mean, who would who, who? Those are not the things you you know just from what they and, say. And I just want to uh, point out one fact because remember there were a lot of people near the end later years in her life said, "Oh, she changed her position. She's back no, being pro-abortion." No, no, such no, thing. no such thing. In fact, we spoke to her within an hour of her dying and passing. And remember, her daughter Melissa called us. We were over in Rome on a, on a business trip, and remember she asked us both. To mm -hmm. not stop, keep working to see the overturning of Roe. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yeah. And then, of course, on June 24th at 1010, when that happened, what did we feel? Looked up to the heavens and said, Norma, promises kept. Yeah. So she, till the day she died, wanted to see the overturning. Well, of another leader that we've worked hand in hand and hard and heart with and still do is Alveda King. That's right. And uh, she... That's another long story, but she and I were both speaking at a Right to Life conference in 1999. Right. And that's when we started talking. And within a few years, she was part of the Silent No More campaign. That's right. right. She had abortion. She had two. And she went on a Rachel's Vineyard retreat. Yes. And then she joined our staff full time. And that's she right. Ended up. So First, we called it African American Outreach. Then it took Civil on Civil Rights to the Unborn. Right. And yeah. uh, we had the Freedom Rise. Remember the Freedom Rise? Oh, I remember this those Freedom was a, Rise. Uh, this was a moment in the pro-life movement back in 2010 that really galvanized the black pro-life movement. The black pro-life movement has grown through these years, through these decades. And uh, those freedom rides were a pivotal moment because we had the black leaders together. We were in the buses. We went from city to city. And uh, Alveda, of course, was at the right at the center of that. And then, of course, as part of uh, our Priest for Life, uh, Gospel Life Ministries and, and Abortion, we have our youth outreach headed up by uh, Brian Kemper of Stand True, mm -hmm. our youth outreach. And now recently this year, we have launched our, we've always done street activism. Oh, always, yes. But now we're just putting a little more strength onto it. And Brian is also going to head up our street activism. Isn't well, it? as our, our, our friend Bob Lanvo from years ago in Staten Island said to me on the street one day, we were picketing, the, you know, we would picket the abortion right. uh, doctor's office uh, right. regularly. He said, Father, he says, they have the media, the pro-abortion people, they go on TV all the time. He says, our media is the streets. Streets, right, and, that's uh, right. And, uh, <laughs> that's always been our spirit. Right. Get people. When we convert people, when we activate people in the churches mm -hmm. to understand the urgency of fighting abortion, protecting the unborn, the idea is that they go from the churches into the streets. Right.
And so I want to invite our people, you know, that we are all available to come into your neighborhood, into your right. church, into your schools, uh, at your banquets. So we have yourself, okay, pro-life leader Frank Pavone, Janet Morana. We have Brian Kemper. We have Father Dennis Wild. We have Kevin Burke. Teresa Burke, all ready and able to come. And if you want to get street activism started, maybe there aren't any people in your area that are praying in front of the abortion mill and things like that. We will send Brian out there to help have a meeting and help organize you and lead one of those events. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the, the thing is, just have one start and then it catches on. Yes. Nothing is more inspirational. And also to m- want you to say, I'm not going to go away from this work is to stand in front of an abortion mill and you watch women going in to destroy the life of their child. Mm-hmm. And you're there trying to intervene. It really brings the issue front and center, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It brings the reality of it home to the mind and heart. Right. Uh, that's you always win when you go out, when you take this issue out into the streets, you always win because whether people oppose it, or agree with it, they're confronting it. That's right. The issue, the tragedy of abortion must confront people and people must confront it. The only time no progress is made is when they don't think about it. Yeah. We force them to think about and it. And of course, we have a special webpage, prolifeactivist.com. Mm-hmm. They can go to and sign up. And of course, we'll invite Brian. He'll, we'll send him out there to get it going yeah. in their area. Yeah. And then let's not forget the United Nations. Uh, Priest for Life is an NGO, non-governmental organization. We are represented at the United Nations. And through Marie Smith, who heads up our Parliamentary Network for Critical Issues, we... Ha- issue documents, pro-life statements that we get into these meetings, isn't that Yes, that's right. We're present for these uh, meetings and debates, so we're we're there on the public level at the United Nations and also down south at the Organization of American States. States, right. Two different organizations, similar battles. We're standing up for the rights of the unborn in those international arenas. And then through Marie, we're helping also the... um, legislators in all different countries. That's right. Marie and I have spoken, and you've been there too, at the International Catholic Legislators Network, a yearly meeting in Rome. Uh, we have uh, interaction with the different legislators in whether you're talking about Latin America, Europe, all across the world. And they rely on us. They look to the United States. Right. The, 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 I saw this when I worked at the Vatican for a couple of years in the, what was essentially the pro-life office. You get these leaders coming from all these other countries and these legislators, oh, what is happening in the United States? How did you do that? Or how are you making progress? Or how are you responding to Planned Parenthood? We're teaching them. Right. We're equipping them. Mm-hmm. You, you mentioned about the abortion testimonies. You mentioned about Norma McCorvey. Um, in fact, we had Norma uh, uh, give her testimony in some of these uh, Events. arenas. Yeah, yes. Alveda King, the same thing. So we provide our team, we provide our experience, we provide our resources, we provide our strategic insights to the lawmakers in these other countries. That's right. Well, we're going to take a break now. And brothers and sisters, when we come back, we're going to take a question from you, our viewers. And don't forget after that, a free gift to you. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. I want to be a teacher. I want to be president of the United States. I want to find a cure for cancer. The choice to have an abortion alters the course of the future. Please remember, where there's life, there's hope. A message from Priests for Life. Well, hello. Welcome back to our program. And of course, now we're going to take a question from you, our viewers. Well, today's question is Blake in Illinois, and Mm -hmm. he writes, what is the church's best document about abortion and the pro-life movement? Well, great, great question, Blake. And the answer is very simple. The Gospel of Life by St. John Paul II. Evangelium Vitae is the Latin title. And you can find the document as well as a commentary that we at Priests for Life have prepared at the website gospeloflife.org. This document was created, uh, started with a special meeting of the world's cardinals in 1991. Uh, The Pope called them together to address the grave 
threats to human life in our day. And so these cardinals came and they talked about uh, the abortion issue and the church's response. The Pope wrote a letter to all the bishops of the world asking their input into this, and the recommendation was made that the Pope issue a major document. It's called an encyclical, which indicates uh, the word means it goes around the whole world. Uh, and it's a document for the whole church, and it is talk. It is the best document that the church has issued about abortion. It's very biblically rooted. People from all denominations love it, and it asserts with the highest authority of the church that abortion is never, never justified. It also talks a lot about the intersection of the abortion issue with the uh, state and, and with the government. It says, in fact, in that document that by legalizing abortion, a state destroys itself. It says the disintegration of the state itself has begun and it's the death of true freedom, and it's a contradiction of the very principles of democracy. Instead of people all finding an equal home in the state where the weak are protected from the strong, you have instead a situation where there is a war of the strong against the weak, and therefore all rights become negotiable. That's just one example of the many arguments that are made in this document. So the gospel of life John Paul II, it was issued in 1995. In fact, it was issued on March 25th. And the significance of that is that that's the day Jesus became an unborn child. That's the day the church celebrates the Annunciation. Mary is told she's going to be his mother. It was an unexpected pregnancy, but it was the conception in her womb of the person who is God himself. So the Gospel of Life is the document gospeloflife.org is the website. Thanks, Blake. And of course, our team put together a study guide yes. that they can also get at that same website. That's right. right. That's great. Well, um, I also want to just remind everyone in, in an overview that all the things we've been talking about and links to all our projects and all the ministries that are under our banner go to endabortion.us, right? Endabortion.us. That's our main okay. site. Yeah. And of course, our TV programs are airing on endabortion.tv. TV. And every week when you, we are not traveling, I know around 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, you do a scripture reflection. You That's read right. scripture and you give a sermon. Well, and they can see on End Abortion TV the links to the different social media platforms where these programs air. And also we have our podcast. And guess what the podcast is called? The and, End Abortion Podcast. In fact, it's the most popular pro-life podcast. Really? Yeah. Okay. And then, of course, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we broadcast. It's the Mer Hour of Mercy. And we have the uh, Divine Mercy Chaplet followed by the Rosary with the nice spiritual reflection time. And, of course, uh, Monday through Friday in the evenings uh, at 8 o'clock, you are on Praying for America, right? which is part of our, our Right Side Broadcasting family. Of and uh, and Getter. Getter uh, uh, broadcasts it live. Okay. And then 9 o'clock, most evenings, we will now have this program twice a week. Uh, and on Friday evenings, we have our uh, Pro-Life News Show. Primetime News. Primetime yes. News, which yeah. airs on Friday and Sunday evening. And sometimes in between, a Just Ask Janet episode appears too. So, and I'll uh, get on live and just do a Q&A. Uh, sometimes too. Yeah. Well. So go to endabortion.tv. We always have the week's schedule up there on the sidebar, mm -hmm. and you'll be able to see all the great programs. Well, thanks for a great show. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, brothers and sisters, I did pr promise you a free gift before we go, and it is this. It's the Roe v. Wade Overruled Booklet written by pro-life leader Frank Pavone. Absolutely free for you. It's a great booklet. Oh, and it's about 12, 13 page long. But so many people don't understand that decision what did the decision really say? What did the justices say? And where do we go from here? This booklet will help you. We're going to send it to you as a free gift. Just go to prolifeproducts.org and you will get this booklet for free. Just enter in. There'll be a special code there for you that you saw the program on endabortion.us. And this is our gift for you. Well, thank you for joining us. And until next time, Janet Marana. Executive Director of Priest Life. God bless. And remember, there are some abortions only you can stop and some lives only you can save. Join us again next week.